time. Okay, compound events. Um, just a quick mention. I think the echo cut out the end of last um, um, uh, last lecture, but I didn't. I don't think we said anything that went past the recording on echo. Basically, just that the final exam will test more your understanding on topics three, four, five primarily. So I'll put the information pretty much all up on Moodle. Um, any um, outstanding admin type problems, questions? Okay, if not, let's look at this one. So this is the last uh, section of topic four before we start topic five on Wednesday. And really this builds upon some of the, um, some of the content we saw from last time just in terms of multi-stage events. So we can't always just simply list out all the possibilities, but sometimes it's easier to consider if one event builds upon another. So um, some various ways we could visualize this is let's say if we have at least two stages, then there's a couple of things we can do. But one thing is to visualize them in a table. So a very classic one is if we look at the at two dice rolling and calculating their sum, well, we could use a list to, uh, table to list all the possible sums. So the table would look something like this. What would be my range of values? What would be the smallest sum? What would be the highest sum out of interest? If we're rolling two dice between one and six, two to 12, yeah. So you could just fill this in pretty simply. It's just gonna be the sum, right? Two, three, four, et cetera, up until we get 12 at the bottom. So we'll get something like this. How is this useful? Well, let's say we want to do something like uh, calculate the probability of rolling a sum of 10. And you could see that all we need to do is just select, consider these as our options. And so what do you think the probability is that we roll a 10 if we're rolling two dice? Three on 36. Three on 36. Do we agree with that in chat? At least before we simplify. Yeah, it's going to be the this is the desired number of outcomes over the total outcomes. So it's simply going to be three on uh, thirty six, which is one twelve. Okay, so far so good. Let's try another example. So um, this is HSC question, and we've got two coloured dice. So we've got uh, different values on the different dice. So on a blue die, we've got the face values of 4, 6, 8, 9, 10, 12. On the pink die, we have face 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 13. And what are we asking? Well, we would say that um, a player wins if the number on the pink die is larger than the number on the blue die. So there's sort of a, our event would have a yes event or no event, right? Um, so out of all our possibilities, well, we could have all possibilities of faces of the pink die and faces of the blue die. Oh, yes, and um, basically you want to calculate the probability of winning the game by a table of possibilities. So just list out, list out all poss possibilities. Well, we've got any value for the, the values 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 13 for the pink and 4, 6, 8, 9, 10, 12 for blue. So pink rolls 2 and blue rolls um, the 4. Would this be here be considered a win or a, or a loss? Which one? I think I didn't specify W, but so let's say W is win and L is loss, lose. What do we think? So from chat, we get a L. L, so the face on the pink die is not bigger. So this is an L here. Two and six, that would be an L as well. I guess they would all lose in this case, right? So um, we've got this right way around. The numbers we go. Yeah. So these are all losses. This would be a win. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, they're all losses again. This would be a win for this one, loss for this one. And so this was going to give us this table. Yep. Yeah. And so if we want to calculate the probability of, of a player winning a game, well, um, we just need to sum the possible W entries, right? So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, right? Uh, yeah, 1 will be there, so 14. 
What do we win out of 36 outcomes? So it's 49, 36, which is 7 18. I might not cover all the examples, by the way. There's, um, um, I might leave a couple of them. All right, everyone happy that's 7 on 18? Right, so in this one, yes, yeah, so in a turn game of, maybe I'll just start this and leave you to finish it off. But um, basically, if we roll two die each with faces zero to five, and we're asking what's the score from multiplying the two numbers. So what's the probability of scoring a zero? What's the probability of scoring 16 or more in the first turn? Well, if we think about it, I won't fill out the whole table, but the only way it would get a zero is just on the first column or the first row. And the only way you could really get 16 or more would pretty much be the, the bottom right corner. So you could see up to here, we would have 12, 15, 12, 15, 16, 20, 20, and 36. So what do you think the answer to part two would be at the very least? This one, the probability of getting a 16 or more, four, so you'd be four on um, 36, which is gonna be one on nine. All right, so that's um, basically just that, that example. We're going to with tables, right? Just listing all the possibilities. Nothing too new to that one. I guess we could just do the first one. I mean, that's going to be 3, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. So 11 on 36. Not 12, right? Not counting the zero twice. Zero, zero twice. <clears throat> okay, so um, another familiar thing that you might come across is a tree diagrams. And this is especially helpful if the second stage depends on the first stage. So um, this is just another way of listing all the possible outcomes. And what do we do? Well, um, let's just look at an example. So we could toss a coin twice, right? So there's possibilities that the first coin is heads or tails and the possibilities that the second coin is heads or tails. So we'll effectively get this. So running through one possibility is that the first coin is heads and the second coin is heads, then we get the outcome heads, heads. And you can see we get heads, tails, tails, heads, and tails, tails. So is it pretty straightforward how we construct such a, such a tree diagram? So whatever possibilities we have for the first event, here heads or tails, and then for each event, heads or tails for the second event, and then heads or tails for the, for the um, depending on if we have heads or tails. Let me ask you this, what's what's the probability of any one of these occurring if we assume that um it's a it's a fair die, it's a fair coin? One of the four, do we agree with that in chat? The possibilities of any of each of these being one of four? Yeah, so you can tell that these are all gonna be probably one of the four. So it just gives us a way to sort of visualize the two events. Let's try an example. So this time a coin is tossed three times. And we use a tree diagram to find the probability in favor of the event. And I think, yeah, okay. So um, let me list out what we need first, and then I'll um, go back to this. So um, a tree diagram given would be, well, how many different events would we expect, just out of curiosity, if we toss a coin three times? So there's, there's three possibilities, each with heads or tails. Two to the three. So we're going to expect eight. So let's list out. So we could have um, heads, tails for the first coin. I have to write this a little bit neat here. Um, the second coin could be heads or tails. And then the third coin from there could be a heads or tails again. Heads, tails, heads, tails, or heads, tails. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, each possibility. Um, and just to note what the outcomes are. Well, um, we've got heads, 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 tails. Could have heads, tails, heads. So I'm just running through each chain, right? So to work out, well, this possibility here, it's going through that way. Uh, heads, tails, tails. What's the next one? <coughs> Tails has heads agreed. Let me check from chat. We're happy. Oh, that's the one. Yeah, tails has heads. Okay, so let me just spell them all out. Tails has heads. 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 T
tails, heads, tails, 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 heads, and tails, tails, tails. Right, so um, now we can try and work up our possibilities. So the probability of getting it one heads and two tails in any order, well, um, how many different outcomes would that represent out of the eight given? Three, do we agree with that in chat? Two, oh, okay. What do we think, is it two or three? Two or three ways to get one head and two tails. In any order. Do we have a tiebreaker in chat? Two or three. Well, let's run through. So um, this one has one head and two tails there. This one has one head, two tails here. This one has two heads and one tail. So it's going to be three, three outcomes. Yeah. So um, the probability here would be uh, three, that's the desired outcome, over eight. Three ways of a heads, tail, tail, of any order. So it's three eighths. Just erase that a little bit. Um, three heads or three tails. Two and eight, yeah. So um, there's only two distinct possibilities: heads, 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 or tails, tails, tails. So it's um, it's simply this event: two eights, which is one quarter, and at least one tail. How many have at least one tail? Let's check. So seven or eight, yeah. So we could just count that. It's um seven or eight here and um, you might notice there's an also a different efficient way to see that so it's going to be seven on eight so three eighths one quarter seven eighths let's rewrite that a little bit neater all right happy with this one so just three stage events for this one Okay, let's move on. Um, okay, this is a nice one. So um, what is the situation here? So we've got two roads, um, M and N, between towns A and B. And we also have three roads, X, Y, and Z, between towns B and C. So the idea is, um, here's our town A, here's our town B, here's our town C. We could take either road M or road N, and then we could take either X Y or Z. So, you know, we could take, say, road M down Y, or then we, so that's one way to get from A to C, or we could take road AB down to, um, through N, then X. So different ways of transporting from A to C. Okay, so what do we actually ask for? So, yes, we can choose, choose a path um, randomly, choosing M or, M or N and then X, Y or Z. And when we look at what's the probability that the traveller will travel over roads M and Y specifically, so, i.e. this, this um, first road. Any thoughts? Mm. Let's just check. So, um, yeah, one and a half, yeah, so there's two ways to view it. Um, one way you could notice it if we look at a tree diagram, well, all the possibilities would be to go um, Oh, let's just note it here. Yeah, I wrote on this one. So you could go M, X, M, Y, M, Z, or N, X, N, Y, N, Z. And so there's only one possibility out of the six listed. So M times Y. Or well, the other way to note it, to note how you could do this is to note the independent events, and there's half probability here, half probability here, and one third probability here. So that's some, um, if we look at a probability tree. So it's equivalent to, to solving it that way as well. Okay, we have the tree diagrams so far. Just listing out the outcomes. Okay, so um, that's that's if they're all equal probability, right? So it's purely just the number of desired outcomes over the total number of outcomes. The next thing to consider are probability trees. 
And so um, that sort of relates onto what listing these as half and a third. Um, so this is useful if we have different probabilities depending on which branch we take. Okay, so if there's a different weighting, a different probability weighting. In which case we use the multiplication rule. And one very important fact, so this is similar to being sure that we only sum probabilities if they're multi if they um, are mutually exclusive, um, we can multiply probabilities, so the probability of A and B occurring, being the probability of A times the probability of B, but only if we know that these are indeed independent outcomes. So with the previous example, it was independent if we choose, chose M or N as our road versus whether we chose X, Y or Z, which is why it was still a half times a third. So in the case that our stages are indeed independent, then we can calculate this as our as our probability of, uh, of both events occurring. Okay, just to remind us that that's for both again, right? Let's look at an example to see how this works. So in this case, we've got a box with 33 scars made from two different fabrics. And there are 14 scars made from either silk or wool. So let's just say the events are S and events are W. Uh, two girls each had a random uh, scarf to wear from the box. Uh, clear prob uh, probability, uh, probability tree diagram to illustrate this um, uh, event. Well, um, what am I going to have for my first um, part of the tree? Yeah, I suppose you could consider, yeah, yeah. So we could have either S or W for the, the first um, part of the project, right? So um, we could choose a scarf that was um, uh, wool or a scarf that was silk. Um, and they each select one, so this would be for the first girl, let's say, the first scarf. There's also the second scarf, so that could be a W on S. Um, let me just note what it said. Yeah, I'll get that in a second. Forty-four. Uh, yeah, yeah, we'll get to the now. So yeah, so the first one, the first one would either choose out of fourteen out of thirty-three possibilities so that's given. I've got a more printed one in a second, and the next one's going to be out of a choice of nineteen on thirty-three. So um. So I guess oh, I suppose I should have had this to start with. So we've, we're we're given these two things to complete. Okay. Um. Now if the um. Let's say, so we've taken out a silk one. So how many how many silk scarves would be left and how many wool scarves would be left at this stage? Yeah, we'd have 13 silk and 19 wool left. So if we want to complete this, um, yeah, exactly. So we'll have, um, well, I suppose I'd think of more as 14. Well, not over 19, it would be over the total. So if we want to calculate the probability of going from silk to silk, if we've already taken a silk scarf out, we're out of a total of 32 and there's 13 here. So that's the new total is 32. S to W, well, that would, what would S to W be? What would be the probability here? Exactly, 19 on 32. We agreed with that in chat? There's 19 wool scarves. That was versus... Uh, yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. I see. Yeah. yeah sorry. Okay. You're right. Yeah. So it's going to be um 1932. Okay. I understand the comment now. Thanks, anyone. Okay. Likewise, if we go from wool to silk, well, at, if we take a wool uh, uh, a wool scarf first, we'll be left with 14 silk ones still, and now we've taken out one of the wool ones, so there's 18 wool out of a total of 32. So, so far um, down this next path, we would have 18 on 32, which would simplify, but I'll, yeah, this will simplify as um, uh, 9 on 16. Otherwise, there'd be a choice of 14 on 32, which will simplify as 7 on 16. So these are the, um, these would be the four um, possibilities. And within each branch, these sum to one. Um, I guess to get a, a complete total probability tree diagram, we can work out the probability of them of both occurring. 
So the probability of getting an, an SS would be the multiple, right? So the probability of going down this first branch and the second branch. So that would be 14 by 32 on 32 there, which is going to be, um, let me just write it out. It's going to be this as a common two here. So that cancels out with seven and 16. So it should overall be, um, uh, let me just leave it like that. So it's going to be, um, let me erase this thing. Rewrite that a bit better. We're going for time. I might just leave it as the product here. So it's going to be um, 14 on 33 times 13 on 32. Probably of S than W would be. Um, 14 on 33 times 19 on 32. That should be a 4 there. Probably of W then S would be um, 18 on 32 versus 9 on 6. One, oh yeah, 9 on 16. Would be, um, oh, sorry, 19 on 33 times 9 on 16. Same as above, right? Think about why that's the case. And P of WW would be 19 on 33 times the 7 on 16. Uh, I think it's there. Okay, so the product of, of those four. Okay, so you can see that it depends. Um, we get a different probability depending on the previous um, branch taken. Okay, let me just keep in mind these these numbers here, right? Um, <clears throat> so um, how can we use this? Well, um, the first thing we want to do is work out the probability that the two scars were made from silk. Well, that's exactly what we just did, right? So um, this is the probability that we have SS, which was going down this track. 30, 13 on 32 again. So it's 14 on 33 times 13 on 32. This cancels a 7 and that's 16. So it's going to be 91 lots of 13 on 16, which is going to be. Um, uh, let me just that again. Five twenty-eight. I'll take you for it. Five twenty-eight. 91 on 528. 480 plus 48, yeah, the 528. Um, what's the next one? Um, um, no, I, I guess... No, because I, I guess the problem is that the second... Someone has to pick a scarf first. So it's not like... Um, they can take a scarf at the same time. Yvonne's probably going to tell me something about quantum physics not being considered. But um, yeah, one one person takes one scarf and the second person takes a second scarf. So there has to be some some order somehow. They can't both take it at the same time. No quantum mm -hmm. physics scarves. <laughs> I just know I'm just picturing exactly what someone's going to say. <laughs> it's not a scarf. All right, all right. So that's the first case and um. What's the second case? The probability that the two scarves selected are made from different fabrics. Well, um, what am I? What's my event there? Um, that would be for one of them, right? Um, yeah, it's it's going to be either if it's if it's SW or um, WS or union of these. If you want to say that more precisely, just write that a bit neater again. And again, these are mutually exclusive. So we can write this as P of SW plus P of WS. They're mutually exclusive events to say that. And the sum of these was, again, going down either this chain, which is going to be, we're left with um, 19 on 32 in this case, and we're left with um, 14 on 32 in this case. So it's going to be um, the sum of these. Um, Right, just to simplify all of these, that's 7, that's 16, that's a 7, that's 16. So in total, it'll be um, 
two lots of seven by 19, that's the same number. 69.33, that's eight. That's gonna be 91 over, um, forget. That is indeed 133. Good thing I calculated it, so it's wrong. Eight by 33, 264. All right, so that's how to run through the tree there. I think that's the last example of that one. Okay, everyone sees the benefit of the, of the um, probability trees. Yeah, I think I want to do this one. I might skip the next example. Okay, so um, in this case, um, so there's uh, two different drugs involved and you, uh, there's a prob probability of being cured with either drug. So probability of a cure with drug A is 0.8, probability of a cure with drug B is 0.6. And we tr um, take one really selected patient and they're treated with either drug A or drug B. And we want to complete the following probability tree to represent this situation. Yeah, so um, uh, let me, okay, I'll just put it here. So, um, Right, so if we consider that we've got the first patient and the second patient, well, the probability that the first patient is cured is 0.8 as before, the probability that they're not cured is therefore 0.2. Now, um, we're given that the probability that, they, um, that they're cured by the um, second drug is 0.6. Um, how does that relate to the second branch? Mm -hmm. Just check from here. It doesn't. <laughs> well, it sort of does. Um, so the first patient had drug A, right? So this is really just off drug A. The second one is off drug B. So we've got cases. Um, uh, how do I put this? So this would be, um, let's say, if they're cured by A and cured by B, this would be probability of the complement event, right? So if A is, um, let's write this at the top here. A is cured by A, B is cured by B. This would be a complement, or you could say A1, A2. This would be um, B, uh, B complement, B, B complement. So um, there's two different cases here, right? So A, B, A, B complement, a complement B and A complement B complement. So the probability that they could be cured com could come from either here or here, right? So the sum of these should be equal to 0. 0.6. Or uh, alternatively, just to note that these should all be 0. 0.6, right? Right, so um, and these independent events, right? So we know that the probability of 0. 0.6 given the first patient cured. And for the, um, well, what's this other branch going to be? What's the probability that the person isn't cured? From, from drug B. 0. 0.4, yes. Yeah. So it's going to be one less this probability, so that's 0. 0.4 there. That's going to be 0. 0.4 here. Well, it doesn't really. So um, that's why it's 0 0.6, 0 0.4 here. Um, I'm getting that right. Yeah, so the, it's a completely different patient, so it's independent. Yes, yeah, so unless it was the same patient, then it would matter if they were cured or, or not from the first drug. But they're, they're just completely separate um, events here, so they should be independent. Oh, okay. Yeah. If it was to say the same patient, then um, we would say that, well, if they're cured already, then there's, well, they've got a 1%, yeah, they'd already be cured, right? Yeah, <laughs> so, um, yeah, so that would be the case there. Um, right, so that's 0 0.6, 0 0.4 each time. Um, if you want the probability that they're both cured, well, um, that would mean we would have to go down 
the first part of the chain, right? So um, AB, um, which would be um, the probability that the, um, the first patient was cured by the first drug times the probability that the second patient was cured by the second drug. And again, this depends on the independence independence of A and B for me to say that because it's both A and B. So that's going to be point A times point 0.6, point 0.8 times point 0.6, which is point 0.48. So 48% chance. And well, the second one you can probably tell is going to be if they're neither, if neither the patient is cured, and so we're only really relevant that this is point 0.4 here. And so this will be the probability that it's um, not A and not C, and that's going to be the probability of not A occurring times the probability of not B occurring. So don't forget that's saying not A, not B, if we want to spell it out, which is the 0.2 times the 0.4, which at the end of the day would end up being um, uh, 0.08, so 8% 8 chance there. Okay, everyone happy with um, these two examples to illustrate those results? So I like to just think, just run down the chain, right? Run down the branch of each um, of the possibilities. Um, yeah, maybe I might come back to this if we can. I might just... This is pretty much the same question, so I might skip this and come back to it if we get time at the end. So you can see it just... Um, oh, Let's do it quickly. I think yeah, we've got time to cover this one. So um, this one depends a little bit, right? So um, we've got two players, so um, Greg and Jack. And so there's the event that uh, Greg wins and the event that Jack wins. So let's just say G for Greg wins, um, Jack for J for Jack wins. Here. And so if we want to construct the tree diagram in the two round sequence, well, um, there's the first round, there's the second round. We could have Jack, Greg wins or Jack wins, Greg wins or Jack wins, Greg wins or Jack wins. And these have um, a dependence, right? So um, if Greg wins the first round, so, um, the probability of winning the second round is increased to 0.6, so we know that's 0.6. And if Greg loses the first round, so if Jack wins the first round, the probability of Greg winning is, is reduced to 0.3, so that's going to be 0.3 there. Right for Greg, 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 Jack, and Jack, Greg, and Jack, Jack. Um, are we given any other information? Yeah, pretty much. They have equal chance of winning the first round. So that's something else that we've got there. So what does that tell us? For the first branch, right? So that's 0 0.5 and 0 0.5 there. And I guess we can just finish off um, this one just to note that's going to be 0 0.4. That's going to be 0 0.7. And so um, that's going to be the first round, second round, and G, uh, Greg, Greg, Greg Jack. And so if we want the probability that Greg wins exactly one round, well, um, Greg can only appear once. So either Greg wins and Jack wins the next for Greg to win the first one, or Jack wins and then Greg has to win. And that's our only possibilities. These are mutually exclusive, so it's going to be the sum of these events. And so that's going to give us, um, it's going to go through either uh, this part of the chain Or this part of the chain. So it's either 0 0.5 times 0 0.4 plus 0 0.5 times 0 0.3. And again, there's some independence. Well, it depends, right? So this probably this next chain depends on the next one. So this is going to give us a 0.2 plus 0.15. So in total, it's going to be 0.35. So Greg has um, 
35% chance of winning exactly one of the um, one of the rounds. Okay, happy with this one. Let's move on. Yes, and so I'm um, part of moving on from uh, the probability uh, tree diagrams depending on on the multi-stage events is whether we have replacement or with um, replacement or without. So a nice uh, good example to start with is um, if we've got an urn with two white balls and three red balls, one ball is drawn at random from the first urn and then returned to that from that urn and then returned to the urn after its colour is noted. Well, would that be a with replacement or without replacement type problem? If it's returned to the urn, it's with replacement, right? So um, um, yeah, we replaced it back. And if the second ball is then drawn at random from the urn, so um, what's the probability that both balls are white? And um, if the first ball is um, not returned to the urn before the second ball, what's the probability that both balls are white? So um, let me just say here, so this is case one, this is case two. So for the first case, we just note this here. So we've got um, red as being three. So um, let's say R for red, W for white. In the first case, well, we would go um, red then white, red then white for the second ball, red then white for the second ball. Well, in the first case, um, let's say first ball, second ball. In the first case, we've, well, we've got five balls in total. So the probability of it being red is five fifths, probably being white is two fifths. And well, we're going down the chain. Well, if we're only interested in um, the second one being white, well, we've replaced the ball. So there's still going to be two white balls and two um, and, and five balls in total. So two fifths. And in fact, this would still be three fifths three fifths and two fifths. Um, so the probability of having a white ball on a white board would be two fifths times two fifths. Probably white first, probably white second. And that's four and 25. So it's without replacement. And um, how do you think this changes if we look at um, with replacement? So if the first ball is not replaced what's going to change here well close I mean it's going to change this probability right so um let's think of the other case so um, um yeah I'll just do a new slide you must be there. So um, in the second case, as before, if we have red and white, we would have three fifths here, two fifths here. But on the second, um, uh, in, in the second case, well, um, once we've taken a white ball out, for instance, then we're left with um, four balls in total, three of which are red, one of which is white. So at this stage, there's only a quarter chance of getting a white ball because we've taken one out. So it's changed. The replacement has changed our, our second stage. And you can tell by um, similar, similarly that there will be three quarters chance to go to red from white. And um, just to complete, we don't need this to answer uh, this question, but just to complete the, the probability tree, um, we would have, um, if we take a red ball out, we'll be left with, um, two white and two red. So it's going to be equal chance. It's going to be two fourths, which is a half. So in this case, um, with replacement, sorry, the previous one, the previous one should be with replacement. This one is without replacement. So this would be the two fifths times the quarter, which is going to be one on two, which is one tenth. Okay, so happy with the difference? Same thing with or without replacement. 
So typically the width replacement, the probability is the same, more the same. It's with that replacement when the, there's more dependence. Okay, happy so far. Uh, okay, let's move on. Um, yeah, I think, uh, let me skip this one for now. And I'll see if we can come back to it. Okay, so for this example, um, five candidates, we've got um, A, B, C, D, E, standing for election. And they simply have their names written on a piece of cover. So you can think it's like one of the state elections, right? Where um, you can order um, who you who we're voting for. And um, the idea is this person, let's say, just randomly just determined the positions, like blindly just went and <laughs> write out where who goes where. And so basically you can think um, what's the picture. So firstly, what's the probability that the um, first card A is drawn first? Well, um, what do we think? If you randomly select A, B, C, D, or E, one on five, we agree with that. It's simply one on five. Yeah, one fifth. So um, there's five possible choices for the first card. So we place write the first one as A, and there's one fifth possibility that we did that, probability that we did that. Next, what's the probability that the order of the names are shown as exactly A, B, C, D, E, that we just randomly selected that choice? What do we think? One on five factorial, is that what we agree with? Do we agree with one on five factorial? Maybe why or why not? What do we think? Well, let's see. So, um, well, that would be the total number, right? Mm -hmm. If we're after the probability, it's one on um, one on five p five. That's a, that's actually equivalent because five p five, the number of ways of ordering five um, five things, is actually exactly five factorial. It's five. By the way, I think I mentioned this in the pre lecture, but I didn't mention in the actual lecture um, last Monday. Um, is that sometimes it's called a falling factorial? This p notation. So this would stand for five by four by three by two by one, which is exactly five factorial. It's the same thing. Ordering five things of five things is ordering five things. So yeah, you could view it that it's 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 there's only five there's five factorial ways, and it has to be unique. Um, or another way to approach it is to say, well, there's one fifth ways of choosing the first card, and once we've chosen that, we're only choosing this out of B, C, D, and E. So to make sure that I'm choosing this one to be B. I'd have a quarter possibility. And likewise, I'd have a third possibility that I managed to just guess that this was C, half possibility, probability times at one. So that's two different ways you could view this problem. You could view that the first one we saw had probably fifth, and the second one has probably quarter, then the next one has third, so on. So the probability of getting A, B, C, D, E is a fifth times a quarter times a third times, I probably could have even just listed it out explicitly, right? fifth times fourth times third times half times one, which is one on five factorial, which is one on 20. Or you could just note that there's 120 possibilities, but only one um, desired, which is exactly this expression. So there's two equivalent ways you could approach that problem. And again, this depends, um, these are independent, right? So again, um, it's independent of, of which choice once we've chosen the A, it's independent choice of cards. Put dimension there. Okay, happy with this one? I guess you could think about which one you find more um more um natural to calculate. Okay, and um Last thing, and we've actually done this a couple of times already, and that is um, if you want to consider the complementary pro probability. And this is useful in cases where it's it's sort of hard to calculate the probability of something that we want to occur, but it's easy to calculate the probability that of the opposite, so the complementary event to occur, so that something doesn't happen. Oops, down, not up. Yeah, so it's easier to calculate P of A complement rather than P of A using this rule. And so um, where does this come from? Simply, we could just note that 
since we know that A and A complement are mutually exclusive, which tells us that the probability of A plus the probability of A complement, and that's also the whole sample space. So P, we'll even go one step before that. Um, that's A union A complement. And so the possibility of something occurring or something not occurring is, is anything. So this is the whole sample space, which is, has probably one. So basically you get these rules that you can just take one minus the probability of the, of the negated or the complement case. And so to see that, I guess, with another example is to consider this question. So let's say we've got three students working on a math problem. And the probability that Annie solves the problem is a half. Probably that Bill solves the problem is a half. And the probability that Charlie solves it is a quarter. Charlie maybe isn't as strong as Annie or Bill. And one want to find the probability that at least one of the students solves the problem. So um, we could list out all the possibilities, right? We'd have um, A, B, and C. So we could either have that A solves it, B, C doesn't solve it, or B solves it, and A solves it, etc. So there's going to be seven different cases with different probabilities, but it's a lot easier just to boil it down to the complement case. So the complement probability is that none of them solve it. And so to work out the problem, the, the, pos, the probability that none of them solve the problem is well to note that, um, that Annie will not solve it and he um, doesn't solve it. Uh, let me just write it here, sorry. Let's put the line there. And he doesn't solve, it's going to be um, a half. Bill doesn't solve, it's going to be probably a half. And of course, um, if Charlie solves it with probably a quarter, then Charlie doesn't solve it with probably three quarters. And it's all easy to calculate that the probability that no one solves the problem is going to be 3 on 16, right? Just by the product of that one case. And so to go back to the problem at hand that what at least one of them solves it, it's going to be one minus that value. So one minus three on 16, which is going to be 13 on 16. So I think we've done that a couple of examples now, but that's, that's the idea. And do we have one more example of this in play? Yeah, I think we can finish this in the time left. So, um, Let's just list this as a practice. So um, say, for instance, Chris has four pairs of socks. Each has a different color. And so he selects the sock one at a time and at random. Um, so we want to, um, we're noting that the probability that he does not have a matching pair after selecting the second sock is six on seven. Explain why this is so. So we're given the, the answer. We just need to justify it. Well. Well, how many ways is there of getting a matching pair? So I've got two socks, right? Sorry? Yeah, it's one on seven. I mean, the um, the second sock has to match the first one, right? So that's the idea. So you can calculate the probability of having a matching sock is one on seven. Just to spell it out, the first sock doesn't matter. There's, um, there's any any possibility. Second sock has to match the first one, and we have an option out of seven, so it's one seven, which means that six do not match the sock. So the, the probability of not matching a sock is one minus one seven, which is six sevenths. Um, let's say we've got three socks chosen. We want to find the probability that he does not have a matching pair, and so of course there's there's a few different possibilities of whether any of the two of the first three do match, but it's a lot easier to calculate when none of them match. So to try and pick, um, oh, well, actually, yeah, this is the, the probably that none of them, none of the three socks match. And so, well, to choose that, well, it's the six on seven that the first two socks don't match. And then we need to multiply by a choice of five on six, rather four on six, because we need to not match any of the first two. Right, so we can only choose four possibilities out of the six remaining. That do not match the first two. So this is going to be this expression, which turns out to be four and seven. And then, of course, the next thing to consider is um, what's the probability that the first three socks do include a matching pair, and that would be one minus that first what's the probability. So it's the complementary event. It's going to be three on seven. Okay, that was a little bit fast, but um, it just builds upon one minus the probability um, we've calculated.
Okay, that was a fair few different examples, but hopefully the, the idea is clear there. You can probably um, just rehash some of those examples. All right, questions, comments? Maybe I'll stop the recording now because um, that's right up to where the timer stops. Otherwise, we'll start statistics next time. All right, I think we best leave it there. It's a fair few examples. Um, maybe we should have taken one or two out of it. Anyway. <coughs> Thanks, everyone. So we'll start topic five next time. Thank you. Cheers.